and turn my mic on and I actually just shut it off, it makes me think, have you guys been listening to me through the microphone this whole time? It's just a weird feeling. So hopefully Jeff's been paying attention, and if I had it on, then he got it turned off for me. But when I was down at Uplift a couple of weeks ago, I ran into a friend of mine, and, and we were talking about some different things, and he uh, said something about, I can't remember how it came up, but I told him, he asked me how Dory was doing. I said, well, she just retired. And he said, oh, that's awesome. He said, uh, when are you going to retire? And I said, well, I'm not quite to that age yet. And he said, well, what are you going to do when you retire? And I said, I think when I retire, I'm going into youth ministry. And uh, you guys didn't laugh at that. But, uh, he did. He said, he said, yeah, that's a good one. And I said, well, it might be a, a step up. But, you know, you guys didn't laugh. Do y'all think I'm getting too old or something? Well, I'm beginning to question it. Uh, a few year, about a year ago, we had a lock-in here at the church building, and and that I'm not saying I'm getting too old to do youth ministry because I absolutely love working with the kids. Would you hush? It is good for a woman to be silent in the church. Now, you listen to that. Quit. So, anyway. We had this lock-in, and I found out, I'm not getting too old to do youth ministry, but there are some things, it's getting harder to keep up with the kids, I can tell you that. Because that night at the lock-in, we did foot races. We divided up into teams, we did relay races, where you run around the pews, you come up the middle and tag the next person, and they go around and tag the next person and stuff. And it's getting harder at 56 to keep up with kids that are 16, okay? We did, we did wheelchair races. And I didn't participate in that because I was afraid they'd make me be in the wheelchair the whole time. You do not want a 16-year-old kid <coughs> running you around the building in a wheelchair, by the way. That can be dangerous. But we did play one game that was really cool. I can't remember what they called it. It was a game Daniel taught the teams when he was here. And it has something to do with the troll. And here's the way it plays. I got to be the troll. So I come into the auditorium. The kids stay back in the fellowship hall. And I took a flashlight, and I took it apart, and I hid the pieces of the flashlight around the auditorium here. Then we turn off all the lights, and the kids come in, and they have to find the pieces of the flashlight and reassemble it. Because the only thing that will kill a troll is if he gets sh shined with a flashlight. So they have to find the pieces of the flashlight in the dark, put it back together, and shine it on me. And at the same time, while they're looking for that, I'm sneaking around because if the troll touches you, you're frozen. You have to sit down. You can't move again. And so I would kind of lay down under the pews here between the seats and listen for somebody to walk by. And then as soon as they did, I'd jump up and chase them down and try to catch them. Sometimes I would hide in the pews or I hid behind the, the bar back there and, or the welcome center, excuse me, in different places here in the building. And as kids walk by, I jump out and chase them down. And uh, believe me, they, they're quick, you know. And so there was a lot of running in and out of pews and bumping into stuff and everything else. And uh, I got this week as I was studying for this lesson, I thought back about that game because it was actually the kids at some point were kind of, it was kind of creepy, like in an old horror movie. You know, when you're walking through a dark house and there's something hiding around there that might jump out and get you at any time. And the reason I thought about that as I was preparing this lesson is I think in back in the time when Leviticus was written, it must have been kind of <coughs> like that to dwell in the midst of a holy God. Because we've talked about, we've looked about the fact that, you know, there's sin that causes you to be, to be unclean. There's all kinds of other things that can cause you to be unclean. And a holy God in the midst of a common, unclean people is a dangerous thing. Now, if you go back into the second chapter of uh, Numbers, then you're going to find the way that they set up the camp in the ancient times. This is what it was, would have looked kind of like. Your Bible may have a picture, something like this, in, in the back of your Bible, where it, it gives the names of the camps and where they lined up around the, the, uh, the temple or the tabernacle. 
And your Bible may show it a little different. Some say that they lined up this way, one there, one there, and one there, as opposed to this way. But we do know that there were three tribes to the north, three tribes to the south, three tribes to the east, three tribes to the rest, west. The reason I picked this slide is because it's got the smoke and the holiness of God coming out of the middle of that. And that's what I want us to think about. Imagine living in a community where there's all kinds of things that can make you unclean. And right in the midst of that community is this holy God. Now going back to some lessons we did a couple of weeks ago, uh, I want you to think about that blowtorch, the holiness of God that cannot dwell in the presence of common, unclean man. It, it's like a blowtorch in a piece of dry grass. It, it, they don't mix together. And so we talked uh, last week, we know that sin causes you to be unclean. We know that uh, touching, uh, stuff coming out of your body causes you to be unclean. Catching a disease causes you to be unclean. Mildew makes you unclean. Sitting where someone who is unclean sat makes you unclean. Being near or touching something that is dead makes you unclean. And so all your life walking around in this community, as long as you remained clean, you were great. But the minute you became unclean, it's kind of like this danger Will Robinson thing, right? I know some of you younger people are going, what is that a picture of? I didn't put the new one up there. How many of you used to watch Lost in Space when you were a kid? Danger Will Robinson, danger. I was going to put the soundtrack up with it, but it had music in there, and I knew some people would get upset. But anyway, you know what I mean? If you're unclean, there's danger. And, and walking around in that community, it had to have been a little bit nerve-wracking sometime. And if God was not a loving God, he would have just said, you know what? Take your chance. If you get near, close enough to me and you're unclean, <laughs> dust. But God is a loving God. And so as we've been seeing these last several weeks, God loves his people so much that what he wants is to provide a way that they can dwell safely with confidence in the midst of his holiness. One of the things that he provided for his people is that animal sacrifice, the blood sacrifice that cleanses people and makes them whole again. And we've talked about this and we've seen this in some of our other sermons that we've been looking at. But there was something else that God always provided that was necessary for the people to be clean too. Last week we were reading in Leviticus chapter 15, and you may have caught on to this. God always provided two things. One is the blood sacrifice of animals. The other one is water. And we're going to look this morning at how important water must have been for God and question, is it still as important? So I want you to open your Bibles with me. We're going to start in Leviticus chapter 15. Turn there with me. We're not going to read the whole thing, but I want to just read through parts of it so that you pick up on how often this theme comes up. We're going to start reading in verse 4, Leviticus chapter 15, verse 4, says, any bed the man with the discharge lies on will be unclean, and anything he sits on will be unclean. Anyone who touches his bed must wash his clothes and bathe with water, and he will be unclean till evening. Whoever sits on anything that the man with the discharge sat on must wash his clothes and bathe with water, and he will be unclean till evening. Whoever touches the man who has the discharge must wash his clothes and bathe with water, and he will be unclean till evening. If the man with the discharge spits on someone who is, un who is clean, that person must wash his clothes and bathe with water, and he will be unclean with e until evening. Everything the man sits on when writing will be unclean, and whoever touches any of the, clean th any of the things that were under him will be unclean till evening. Whoever picks up those things must wash his clothes and bathe with water, and he will be unclean till evening. Anyone the man with a discharge touches will be will, without rinsing his hands with water must wash his clothes and bathe with water, and he will be unclean till evening. 
A clay pot that the man touches must be broken, and any wooden article is to be rinsed with water. When a man is cleansed from his discharge, he is to count off seven days for his ceremonial cleansing. He must wash his clothes and bathe himself with fresh water. Drop down to verse 16. When a man has an emission of semen, he must bathe his whole body with water, and he will be unclean till evening. Any clothing or leather that has semen on it must be washed with water, and it will be unclean till even. When a, evening, when a man lies with a woman and there is an emission of semen, both must bathe with water, and they will be unclean until evening. Drop down to verse 20. Anything she lies on during her period will be unclean, and anything she sits on will be unclean. Whoever touches her must wash his clothes and bathe with water, and he will be unclean till evening. Whoever touches anything she sits on must wash his clothes and bathe with water. And we could go on and on. All throughout Leviticus 15, there is this washing and bathing with water. And, it, and it's not just here, it's in other places too. The burnt offering in Leviticus chapter 1 verse 8, the burnt offering had to be washed with water before it could be offered up by fire. The priest who had blood spattered on his clothing from a sacrifice had to wash his clothes in a holy place with water. Leviticus chapter 6 verse 27. If, if the meat from a sacrifice is cooked in a bronze pot, that pot had to be scoured and rinsed with water. Chapter 6, verse 28. The high priest and the priest had to be cleansed with water before they could serve the priest as priests of the, in the presence of the Lord. Excuse me. Chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. Several that come uh, out of chapter 16. The high priest had to bathe himself before the offering, the burnt offerings on the Day of Atonement. The man who released the scapegoat had to wash with water before he could come back into the camp. The man who carried the remains of the sin offering outside the camp had to wash with water before he came back into the, into the camp. And there's many more. And we're not going to take the time to read this morning, but when you read through Leviticus, it becomes clear that God instructed his people that, and to quote from my friend's book, they would need two things to become clean after they had become defiled. The blood of sacrifices and water. Both were necessary. Both were commands given by God. And I know some of you are sitting there thinking, I know where he's going with this. And you're right. The question is, that we need to ask ourselves is, does God still demand the same two things today? The blood of sacrifices and water to cleanse a people who have become unclean. And I believe the Bible clearly teaches that the answer to that question is yes. God still demands the blood sacrifice of animals and the washing with water. Now we've spent some time talking about Jesus being the blood sacrifice and we're not going to go back through all of that today but I want us to talk about this washing with water. There are a lot of people today and of course the washing with water I'm talking about is baptism. And there are a lot of people today who will say, you know, well baptism was just something, a ritual invented by the early church. But I want us to understand baptism did not originate with the early church. <coughs> Baptism has its roots here in Leviticus from the beginning when God gave the law. And, and to say that it began with the church, if you go back and you read through the New Testament, we realize John the Baptist, before the church was even established, what was he doing in the Jordan? He was baptizing people. One of the people he baptized was a man named Jesus of Nazareth. Baptism did not originate in the church, baptism has its roots all the way back here in the book of Leviticus. I want you to think about this. The earliest Christians were Jews. The apostle Paul was a Jew. Peter was a Jew. John was a Jew. Most likely the writer of Hebrews, and I say that because we don't know who actually wrote the book of Hebrews, but if you read through the book of Hebrews, it becomes quite apparent that the writer of Hebrews was very familiar with the law and most likely 
was himself a Jew. And so these Jews who began the early church and were in the founding of it, they were all Hebrews, they were all Jews. They knew what God had taught in the book of Leviticus. They understood the blood sacrifice and they understood the importance of the washing. I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 22. I put verse, uh, chapter 9 up there, but we're not going to look at that one. Chapter 9 is where uh, we read the story of a man named Saul who was persecuting the church. He's on his way to Damascus, and on his way there, he encounters Jesus. Jesus, in this encounter, basically makes him blind for a period of time and tells him to go to Damascus, and there he's going to meet a man named Ananias, and Ananias comes to tell Jesus or tell Saul what he's going to be doing, what Jesus has chosen him for. And while he's there, uh, he is baptized. But in chapter 22 of the book of Acts, beginning in verse 1, here is Paul's account of this. By the way, Saul, the Jew that we talked about earlier, uh, becomes more known to us by his Greek name, which is Paul. And in chapter 22, verse 1, here's what he says to a group of other Jews. Brothers and fathers, Listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. They knew then he was a Jew as they were. And then Paul said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. He's speaking to them in Jerusalem, by the way. Under Gamaliel, I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and, and throwing them into prison, as also the high priest and all the early council can testify. I even obtained letters from them to their brothers in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. And he stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. And then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and see the righteous one and hear the words from his mouth. You will be a witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, washing, wash your sins away, calling on his name. In Acts chapter 9, Paul talks about being baptized. And here he tells the Jews that that baptism was the washing away of his sins. Paul knew he was guilty. Paul knew he had committed sin. Paul knew that he was unclean. And just like we, we saw in Leviticus, there had been a sacrifice on his behalf, and now there was a washing as well. I want you to turn with me over to 1 John. If you were in our Bible class, we... We studied through 1 John not too long ago. But in 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, he says, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus is... His Son purifies us from all sin. So there we have the blood sacrifice that cleanses. But now turn over to chapter, uh, chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. John says, This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, 
but by water and blood. And most scholars believe that the water that's spoken of here was Jesus' baptism. And it was the Spirit who testifies because the, the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. So even John understands that there's water and blood that's involved in our washing and in our cleansing. In 1 Peter, look back a few pages to 1 Peter, in chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, Peter says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy He has given us new birth into living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the sacrifice. And into the inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. Now you turn over or look down into verse 18 of chapter 1. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So there's the blood sacrifice. And now turn over to chapter 3, beginning in verse 18. For Christ died for sins once for all, again the blood sacrifice, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when God patiently waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, meaning in the ark, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And now I want you to flip back to the book of Hebrews real quick. Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10 beginning in verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Confidence to enter the most holy place. Back in Leviticus, the only way a common person, common people could dwell in, with, in, in confidence with this holy God is if they were clean. And, and God made sure that he gave them a way to be clean through the blood sacrifice and through the washing of water. The writer of Hebrews tells us that we can have that same confidence to dwell in the midst of a holy God through the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ and being washed in the water. And now let's go back again to our lesson a few weeks ago. I was talking about how awesome it is that God tells His people what they needed to do to be clean. So that they could be safe in the midst of his in the midst of his presence, what they could do to restore that relationship when they had defied it, defiled it, and broken it down. And God said clearly over and over again in Leviticus, this isn't a quote, but this is God's message: If you want to be clean again, you offer a blood sacrifice and you wash. Problem in Leviticus is the blood sacrifice didn't completely clean. They had to keep offering a blood sacrifice. Next time you get unclean, you got to offer a blood sacrifice. Next time you get unclean, you got to offer a blood sacrifice. You also got to wash. And then when you get unclean, you got to wash again. And then when you get unclean, you got to wash again. But, church, God has now done something absolutely fantastic. He has provided for us the sacrifice of His Son. It doesn't ever have to be repeated again. 
And not only that, He has provided us one washing that now takes care of all of our washing forever. We worship a God who saved us, a God who loves us so much. God is not changed. God still wants to dwell in the midst of His people. But His people still were unclean people. But He's provided a way for us to be clean. The blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, and the washing of water through baptism. And it cleanses us from everything. You may need to be cleansed. You may know that there's sin in your life that, that you've never dealt with and you've never come before God and truly, truly been washed in the blood of the Lamb. One thing I want to tell you is once you do this, see back in the old, back in, in Leviticus time, you know, you could sin and you'd go to the priest and the priest would sprinkle some blood on you, wash you, and you just go off on your own way. Then you come back later and you say, guess what, I did it again. And he sprinkles some blood on you, and he pours some water over you, and off you go. And then you come back to him and say, guess what? I did it again. And he does it again. But now God says, I don't want to just temporarily wash you. I want to make you something new. I want to give you a new life. I want to cleanse you, and I want to change your heart so that you will live in my presence all the time where you won't be running off to where you can get dirty. I want you to stay dwelling in my midst. And I want to cleanse you enough that you can do that. This morning, if you've never been cleansed that way, this is the time. We're going to stand, we're going to sing a song. I think my mic just went out. We're going to stand and sing a song. If there's anything that we can help in this church, Anything we can help you do to be in that right relationship with God, to come to Him and experience that cleansing, please come down to the front while we stand in the center. <laughs>